Welcome to lecture 36. Today we'll continue discussing oblique shocks. I'll continue my comments about the theta beta m plot, and I'll work out some example problems with oblique shocks. Here's our theta beta m plot. Recall we plot theta as a function of beta, where beta is the shock angle relative to the incoming flow, and theta is the turning angle, the angle at which the flow suddenly turns after the shock. Recall that beta goes from 0 to 90 degrees, and all of these constant Mach number curves converge at 90 degrees. For any one of these Mach number curves, the minimum beta is mu, the Mach wave angle. Last time I generated this red dashed curve by connecting points of maximum theta for each Mach number. Everything to the right of this line is a strong shock, and everything to the left of the line is a weak shock. For lack of a better term, I'll call this the max theta curve or the max theta line. By the way, for a given Mach number, the bigger the beta, the stronger the shock. And the strongest possible shock is the normal shock, where beta equal 90 degrees. We also see this dashed green line, or curve. This is called the sonic line, or sonic curve. As indicated here, everything to the left of this green line has a supersonic Mach number 2, while everything to the right of this line has a subsonic Mach number after the shock. So M2 equal 1 along this green dashed line, the sonic line. I'll write some comments here. To the left of M2 equal 1, M2 is greater than 1, since the shock is weak. In other words, M2 does not differ much from M1. So zone 2 after the shock is supersonic, where 1 and 2 are before and after the shock as usual. To the right of this sonic line, M2 is less than 1, so 2 is subsonic, since the shock is stronger, and M2 differs a lot from M1. It would be nice if the green and red lines coincided. In other words, the strong and weak division would be the same as the sonic division. But that's not how it is. In fact, there's this region, or zone, that I'll call the strange zone, between the green and the red curves, where you can have a weak shock but the Mach number after the shock is still subsonic. I'll write that here. In the strange zone, the oblique shock is weak, but M2 is subsonic, which behaves more like a strong shock. So unfortunately, because of this strange zone, we can write this. For all strong oblique shocks, M2 is less than 1. And for most weak oblique shocks, M2 is greater than 1, where we have to use the word most because this is true except in the strange zone. Now I'll do a quick example. Air at Mach number 2 turns through an oblique shock with theta, the turning angle of 10 degrees. Using the theta beta m equation, I get two betas, a weak one and a strong one. The weak beta is 39.3 degrees, and the strong beta is 83.7 degrees. This is what you'd see with flow over a 2D wedge of half angle delta equal 10 degrees. The shock angle for the weak shock would be 39.3 degrees, and the shock angle for the strong case would be 83.7. In either case, the turning angle theta is equal to delta, in this case 10 degrees. Again, we don't know which of these will actually occur in the flow without knowing the downstream conditions here. If the wedge were really long, the weak one would be more likely. But if this body suddenly got thicker, the higher pressure in this region could force this oblique shock to become the strong one. We can also calculate Mach numbers and pressures, etc. Recall that M1N, the normal component, equal M1 sine beta, and we use this Mach number instead of M1 in our previous equations for a normal shock. Here, for our example, the weak case has beta equal 39.3 degrees, which when we plug into this equation, gives us a Mach number of 1.267. We repeat for the strong case, where we use this beta, we get 1.988. This does not differ much from 2.0, because this shock is almost a normal shock, whereas this one has a much shallower angle, and so the normal component is much smaller than 2. Again, using our previous equations for a normal shock, treating this as M1 for a normal shock, we would calculate M2, at 0.803, but this is M2n, the normal component of the Mach number after the shock. Similarly for the strong case, 
M2N is 0 0.579. Both of these are subsonic as they must be because they're the normal component across a shock. Also recall from the previous lecture, M2N is M2 sine beta minus theta. You would use this equation to find the actual M2 downstream of the oblique shock. Once we know M1N, we can find pressure ratios and temperature ratios, etc. For example, here's one of our equations for a normal shock in terms of M1, but I wrote M1N here instead of M1. I get 1.707 for the weak case and 4.444 for the strong case. I also want to show you how to calculate these things on the compressible aerodynamics calculator online. Here's our Compressible Aerodynamics Calculator, or CAC. We scroll down to the oblique shock relations. I put in a Mach number of 2 and a turning angle of 10. And notice that we have a choice of the weak or the strong. I'll do the weak first. When I hit Calculate, it gives me M1N and M2N, which agree with my calculations. It also gives the correct beta. The CAC calls it a wave angle. This is beta. Temperature ratios, density ratios, the pressure ratio of 1.707 also agrees with my calculations. If I change this to the strong shock and calculate, there's my 4.444 pressure ratio, and the other values match my calculations as well. I'm always happy when I get this kind of agreement. Now let's recall from our theta beta m plot that for a given Mach number, the curve reaches some theta max at some m1. So we ask the question, what happens if delta is greater than theta max for a 2D wedge? I'll make this statement. It is impossible to have a straight oblique shock with the turning angle greater than theta max for a given m1. Even in the case with m1 equal infinity, recall that theta max was about 45.6 degrees. So a corollary to this statement it is impossible to have a straight oblique shock with a turning angle greater than about 45.6 degrees. So what happens if the wedge angle is bigger than that? The answer is the shock detaches and becomes a bow shock. Again, using Mach number 2.00 as an example, theta max is about 23 degrees, where beta is about 64.6 degrees at that point. For theta less than theta max, a straight oblique shock is possible as we have been discussing. But for theta greater than theta max, a straight oblique shock is not possible. Instead, the flow will jump to form a bow shock. I did some CFD calculations for my textbook where I illustrate this. Here's a 2D wedge with half angle 10 degrees, 20 degrees, and 30 degrees with an incoming upstream Mach number of 2.0. For the 10 and 20 degree cases, we get a nice oblique shock attached to the vertex of the wedge. By the way, we're plotting contours of Mach number. The red color is the high speed Mach number of 2.0, and dark blue goes down to about 0.2 in this color scale. But when theta exceeds theta max, which we just calculated as about 23 degrees, here for example it's 30 degrees, that oblique shock cannot be maintained and it jumps away from the wall and forms a detached bow wave, or bow shock. So my CFD analysis agrees with what we stated above, which I'll state here in a slightly different way. At a given Mach number, M1, there's a maximum wedge half angle, above which a bow shock is the only valid solution. These cases gave me an oblique shock, whereas the CFD converged on this solution that had a bow shock. You would not be able to satisfy the equations of motion with an oblique shock attached to this vertex for this 30 degree case, whether you're doing it analytically or with CFD. We're not going to talk much about axisymmetric oblique shocks. These form when you have a cone rather than a 2D wedge. I just want to point out that similar things happen. Here we have a cone with half angle 20, 40, and 60 degrees. The first two cases give us an oblique conical shock. In this case, the shock is actually symmetric around the axis of symmetry. But just as in the 2D case, if the half angle gets too large, here 60 degrees, we get a bow shock. This is an axisymmetric bow shock. By the way, these lines that you see 
In the background are mock waves. These form when there are small roughness elements on the wind tunnel wall. So if we don't know the upstream Mach number, we could measure the angle of this Mach wave. Here I measure it with my protractor to be 18.4 degrees. So what is M1? If this were a live class, I would make this a candy question. But I guess I'll have to give myself the candy today. Since this is a Mach wave, that angle is equal to mu, the Mach angle. And mu is defined as the arc sine of 1 over m1. So m1 is 1 over sine mu. I get 3.16. It was stated that the actual Mach number of these figures was around 3. So my estimation is pretty close. If we have a spherical body, or in fact any other kind of blunt body, this is a sphere, we also get a bow shock. In fact, any blunt-nosed body will have a bow shock. With blunt meaning that the angle at the nose is 90 degrees. Again, we won't spend much time with axisymmetric supersonic flows. I'll just mention that there is a different but similar theta beta m equation for axisymmetric oblique shocks. Let's compare with our Mach number of 2.0 and theta of 20 degrees. Beta turns out to be 53.4 degrees for the weak case in 2D, but for these same conditions, Beta turns out to be 37.8 degrees for the axisymmetric case. One thing nice about the axisymmetric case is that there's no weak or strong axisymmetric cases. There's just one. I'll show this on the CAC. First, I'll do the 2D weak shock case for 20 degrees, which is the one we're comparing. There's my beta of 53.4. For the conical shock at Mach number 2, there's only one cone angle. It doesn't give you the option of weak and strong, as it does in the 2D case. And the wave angle, or beta, is 37.8 degrees as we calculated. Notice that for the same conditions and the same turning angle, the pressure ratio for the axisymmetric case is much smaller than that for the 2D case. Similarly for temperature ratio, comparing 1.14 to 1.39. In both of these cases, the Mach number after the shock is supersonic, as we see here and here. Since we're getting close to the end of the semester, I'm not going to say anything further about conical shocks or axisymmetric oblique shocks. I just wanted to give you some exposure to them. Now let's go back to the 2D wedge case and do an example. Here we have air flowing at supersonic speed into a two-dimensional wedge. Oblique shocks form. We give the pressure, the temperature, delta, the wedge half angle, an upstream Mach number. We label regions 1 and 2 before and after the shock. We want to calculate shock angle P2 and T2 and M2. We make our usual A and A, steady, ideal gas, adiabatic, and we ignore boundary layer effects along the walls. There will be a boundary layer building up along this wall, which will have a displacement effect that makes this wedge appear to the flow as a little bit thicker, so theta will not be exactly delta but a little bit bigger than delta. But we're ignoring such viscous effects of the boundary layer. So we'll let theta equal delta, or 20.0 degrees. Now we use the theta beta m equation to calculate beta. This has to be done implicitly, since you can't solve for beta explicitly from the theta beta m equation. You can use the false position method, Newton's method, trial and error, however you want to solve for it or you can just use the CAC online calculator. I get beta equal 37.76 degrees for the weak case. Now we can calculate M1n, which is M1 sine beta. I get M1n is 1.837. Now we use M1n in our normal shock equations in place of M1. For example, this is the equation for pressure ratio, but I've replaced M1 with M1n. I get 3.77, and I can use ratios to get P2, where P1 was given. So I get P2 is 382.1 kPa. Now we solve for M2n, using the same equation we had for a normal shock, but again everywhere we have an M1, we replace with M1n, and we solve for M2n rather than M2. I get 0 0.60839, and report it to three digits as 0 0.608. Similarly to pressure, we calculate temperature T2, as T2 over T1 times T1, where we use the T2 over T1 ratio for a normal shock. 
again using M1n and M2n, leaving out the algebra, I get T2 equal 449.2k. So we've calculated beta, P2, T2. Now we need Mach number M2. Well, M2n is M2 sine beta minus theta, which we can solve for M2 and plug in our values. I get M2 is 1.994. Again, it should not alarm us that M2 is supersonic, especially for the weak oblique shock case. Now we'll repeat for the strong oblique shock case. If you're solving the theta beta m equation for the strong case, if you're using an iterative method, such as false position method, you pick your first guesses with the large beta, for example, 80 degrees, to ensure that you get the strong case. Here's a summary of my results for the strong oblique shock case. Beta, M1n, M2n, M2. Notice that this is subsonic, since this is a stronger shock. P2 turns out to be 1,027 kPa, or 10.14 atmospheres. This is much higher than the weak case, as we might expect. Finally, T2, which again is much higher than the weak case. I'll do one more example. This is exactly the same problem as the previous one, except I have a bigger wedge half angle. It was 20 degrees in our previous problem. Well, this one turns out to be a lot simpler, because my theta beta m plot at Mach number 3 turns out to have a theta max of about 34 degrees. Well, our delta is greater than theta max. So this tells us that an oblique shock is not possible for this case. Instead, a bow shock will form, as we discussed earlier, and this is what our flow will look like. We can calculate pressures, etc., across this normal part of the shock. And if we knew the shape of this bow shock, we could locally calculate all the properties downstream of the shock. But we're not going to do that here. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.